Gene data taken during prenatal tests on pregnant women around the world sent to a Chinese company. The firm is linked to the Chinese military but has partnered with U.S. healthcare institutes. The White House says it supports a strong unofficial relationship with Taiwan, but not Taiwanese independence. It's the Biden administration's first public comment on the island, following a hardline speech from Communist China's leader. TikTok owner ByteDance reconsiders its plans to list in the U.S. That's amid Beijing's crackdown on its own tech giants who seek to join the American market. And China opens up about its views on Australia. For the first time, Beijing publicly admits that tariffs on Australian goods were designed as economic punishments. But the nation down under is still profiting off exports to China. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A prenatal test used worldwide is sending gene data of pregnant women to a Chinese company. The company developed the test together with the Chinese military. The U.S. sees a security risk. Rosanna Philpot reports. A Chinese gene company that sells prenatal tests around the world has been harvesting genetic data from millions of women. The company, BGI Group, worked with the Chinese military to develop the tests. BGI is using the genetic data for sweeping research on population traits. The U.S. sees it as a security risk. Government advisers warn that BGI's vast bank of genomic data could give China a path to economic and military advantage and potentially lead to engineered pathogens or genetically enhanced soldiers. I want to know what is happening with such sensitive data about me, such as my genome and that of my child. This is Amelia. She's one of the more than 8 million women who have taken the BGI prenatal test. The 32-year-old office administrator spoke to Reuters on the condition that only her first name be used. She says she did sign consent, saying that her genetic data would be stored and used for research. What she did not realize, however, was that her information could end up in mainland China. BGI's headquarters and research are based in Shenzhen, but the form she signed did not make this clear. It said only that her sample would be sent for analysis to Hong Kong. I have to admit that the news that my data could have been taken over by the Chinese government is shocking for me. After reading the form, I had the impression that I was well informed about the test and how the data would be used. There was information that if I agree to it, it can be used for further studies to improve the method, but no, there wasn't much else. BGI said it had never been asked by the Chinese government to provide the genetic testing data for research. The company's prenatal test, branded Nifty, is one of the most popular in the world. It's sold in at least 52 countries, though not in the United States. Tests like this, taken about 10 weeks into a pregnancy, capture DNA from the placenta in the woman's bloodstream to detect fetal abnormalities like Down syndrome. The tests don't carry names, but they do capture genetic information about the mother, which the test's privacy policy says may be shared for national security reasons. BGI said it hasn't been asked to do that. Online records reviewed by Reuters show that the genetic information of at least 500 women, including some outside of China, are also stored in China's National Gene Bank. Each row seen here is a different woman. Reuters could not determine if Amelia's data is in the gene bank. BGI records personal details such as women's country, height and weight. Researchers say this genetic big data can give clues to genes associated with, for example, bipolar disease or schizophrenia, link genes to height and body fat and track viruses. While the procedure is private, the data is stored. Reuters found no evidence that BGI violated patient privacy agreements or regulations. BGI says it never has access to any identifiable personal data. The company says it only stores location data on women in mainland China and destroys foreign samples after five years. BGI's collaboration with the military on prenatal research has not been previously reported. The gene giant is a pivotal player in a genomics race between China and the US. 
An expert panel led by former Google chief executive Eric Schmidt said in March that the United States should recognize China's strides in biotechnology and AI as a new kind of national security threat. BGI did not respond to questions on its military collaboration or the national security threats that the U.S. says its research poses. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs said the report reflected, quote, groundless accusations and smears of U.S. agencies. Over in Poland, Emilia says that if she had understood the extent of BGI's secondary research, she would have chosen a different test. This could be a very important matter when choosing a test. For me, it would be. BGI is the world's largest genomics company. That's a branch of biology that studies human genes. The firm not only offers prenatal tests, but also CCP virus or coronavirus tests. They include providing technical support and equipment and even handing out donations. BGI has partnered with U.S. healthcare institutions, potentially giving them access to Americans' private healthcare data, including their DNA. And it has sent virus test equipment to Kansas City in the U.S. and established labs in almost 20 countries. Chinese doctor Wang Jian founded the company. He has studied and worked in the U.S. Wang is known to be a huge fan of Mao Zedong, the former Chinese Communist Party or CCP dictator who is responsible for tens of millions of deaths. Wang's company has also been working with the Chinese military. A Reuters report earlier this year revealed their joint research in the fields of brain science, supercomputing and mass testing for respiratory viruses. When the Biden administration's point man on Asia was asked how much love is too much for U.S.-Taiwan ties, he drew a firm line. White House Indo-Pacific Coordinator Kurt Campbell said on Tuesday the U.S. supports a strong unofficial relationship with Taiwan, but not Taiwanese independence. Communist China has long claimed democratic Taiwan as its own territory, despite never ruling the island. Taiwan is governed by its own constitution and elected government. Campbell took part in an online discussion hosted by the Asia Society Policy Institute, a nonprofit organization addressing challenges in the Asia Pacific region. During the talks, Campbell added the U.S. does believe that Taiwan has the right to live in peace, but called keeping peace and stability over the island a dangerous balance. Campbell said China is monitoring global responses to its crackdown on Hong Kong to get a sense of how other nations may respond if similar action is taken on Taiwan. He also said the U.S. has sent a strong message of deterrence to China. Taiwan's foreign ministry responded to Campbell's remarks on Wednesday, calling the democratic island a sovereign state. The ministry said it seeks to protect its democratic system. The Chinese embassy in Japan is sending a threatening message to its host country over Taiwan. The embassy said on Tuesday, anyone who dares to obstruct and undermine the great cause of China's reunification will have their head bashed bloody. That's in response to the Japanese deputy prime minister's remarks on Taiwan the day before. The Japanese official said if the Chinese regime invades Taiwan, Japan may join the U.S. in defending the island. By reunification, the CCP refers to the takeover of Taiwan. The regime has increased military activities near the island in recent times. During a CCP forum in Beijing on Monday, the party's political advisor, Wang Yang, also promoted what he called peaceful and integrated development across the Taiwan Strait and so-called national reunification. That's a softer tone compared to CCP leader Xi Jinping's speech last week. Xi said that reunification is an unshakable commitment of the CCP. But Taiwan does not seem to want it. Its mainland affairs council is responding to Wang's speech, saying that the CCP's so-called peaceful and integrated development is essentially a lie. The council says the CCP uses it to consolidate its one-party dictatorship and to expand its influence to democratic countries. Most Taiwanese people have shown no interest in being ruled by communist China. A recent poll in Taiwan shows that almost 80 percent of respondents have either negative or no feelings toward the CCP. Beijing-based app developer ByteDance has reportedly abandoned its plans to list in the New York market. The company owns widely popular video sharing platform TikTok. 
According to financial blog Zero Hedge, that decision follows uproar with Chinese ride-hailing service Didi. The company saw a staggering sell-off and a plunge in share price just days after its U.S. listing. Its billions of dollars in stock losses triggered by an order from Beijing, mandating its removal from all Chinese app stores. In recent months, Beijing has been expanding its antitrust crackdown on many of China's technology giants. It's wiped a combined $823 billion from their market value altogether. The corporations affected include Tencent, owner of popular messaging platform WeChat, Tycoon Jack Ma's online retail giant Alibaba Group, and Didi. ByteDance is now considering plans to list in Hong Kong instead. Beijing's crackdown has seemingly made one message clear. Chinese firms should stay away from listing in the U.S. market. Instead, they can list domestically or in Hong Kong. Coming up, Australia and China are becoming more clear about their views of the other country. Beijing publicly admits that tariffs on Australian goods are economic punishments. And Australia says it is dealing with a more assertive China, but it's still making good profit from iron ore exports to the country. More on that after the break. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. The Chinese regime is lashing out at Australia again, this time accusing Australia of undermining China's vaccine donation efforts. Australia is saying no to the accusation. The Australian government is denying Beijing's accusation, that is, hindering China's vaccine donation efforts. Uh, But when it comes to the rollout, uh, what we're focused on is just making sure that we are providing as much assistance as we possibly can. If other countries want to provide assistance, uh, that's wonderful. The Chinese Foreign Ministry criticized Australia on Monday, accusing it of blocking China's vaccine donations to Papua New Guinea. CCP mouthpiece Global Times followed suit with several reports. They're claiming that Australia has sent multiple advisors to the Papua New Guinea CDC in order to block Chinese vaccines. But they did not cite their source of information. Australia has announced that it has donated 15 million vaccine doses to its neighboring Papua New Guinea. The Chinese foreign ministry claimed to have donated vaccines to Papua New Guinea this February, but the Papua New Guinea foreign minister denied it. He's saying that they have their own rules and procedures regarding foreign vaccine donations. It wasn't until May that Papua New Guinea approved Chinese vaccines for emergency use. The country accepted 200,000 doses from China and ordered Chinese citizens in the country to use them first. And more on the relationship between Australia and China. The Chinese Foreign Ministry is publicly admitting that tariffs on Australian goods are economic punishments. And Australian officials are also commenting on their country's relations with China. For the first time, Beijing admits its recent sanctions on Australian goods were a form of economic punishment. That's according to an ABC News report on Wednesday. Up till now, Beijing always claimed the tariffs on Australian goods were due to valid trade concerns. China's foreign ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian has said no country should be allowed to profit from China while, in his words, smearing it. He also noted that Beijing will not allow any country to reap benefits from doing business with China while groundlessly accusing and smearing China and undermining China's core interests based on ideology. That was in response to questions about Australia's declining agricultural exports to China. Zhao said that Tuesday night and added, Australia is punished because it wants to help the U.S. to attack China. An Australian official deems Zhao's remarks as a crude attempt to divide Australia and U.S. relations. Federal Treasurer Josh Frydenberg later said that Australia is dealing with, in his words, a more assertive China. China has been a lot more... Uh, assertive in not just its diplomacy, uh, but also in its other positions. Josh told reporters in Canberra the blockage of some exports to China is not a secret, but there is something else. But what is making its way to China, because they need it most, is our iron ore. And the price of iron ore is at near record highs. 
uh, and that is providing you know, significant uh, revenue. Josh emphasized Australia's broader national interest is the priority. Germany arrested a scholar on Monday, accusing him of spying for China's secret service. That's the same day the CCP leader Xi Jinping held an online summit with German Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President Macron. The arrested scholar is identified as Klaus L., a political scientist. He has worked at a German think tank for over two decades and served the Chinese regime for money. That's according to the German prosecutor's announcement. The Chinese intelligence service recruited him during his lecture trip to Shanghai in 2010. The prosecutor's office says the man provided information to Beijing regularly since then and made trips to China until late 2019. The man collected information from various high-ranking political contacts. That's thanks to resources he developed over the years working for the think tank. German broadcaster ARD said the man worked for the Hans Seidel Foundation based in Munich. The foundation didn't make any immediate comment. A UK Parliament committee is urging the government to do more for young people in Hong Kong, giving them more access immigrating to the UK. The Home Affairs Committee of the UK Parliament is urging the Home Office to extend its British National Overseas, or BNO, passports to cover Hong Kong's young people. Currently, they are left out of the scheme with less access to British immigration visas. The committee's report says the UK's new visa scheme should cover young Hong Kongers born after the handover in 1997. Witnesses told the committee that young people are among the most targeted in Hong Kong. That's due to their increased participation in pro-democracy protests. They may also be estranged from their families because of their political opinions and limited financial means restrict their freedom to seek refuge. But because they were born after the handover, they're not eligible for the BNO status. The committee say they're concerned that this gap in the scheme will leave vulnerable young people at risk and unable to leave the region. They suggest the British government extend the BNO scheme to enable a young person with a BNO parent to apply separately from that parent, provided there is evidence of that parent's status. The report also notes some of Hong Kong's young people seeking asylum in the UK might be deterred by current delays. It urges the Home Office to urgently address the situation. Since the end of January, Hong Kong residents with BNO status could apply for a new visa and live in the UK for five years before applying for a permanent residency. By the end of May, over 34,000 Hong Kongers have already made the application. According to a survey, one-fifth of Hong Kong residents plan to leave the city permanently. That's 1.5 million people. It's estimated that 250 to 300,000 Hong Kongers will emigrate to the UK in the next five years. Senior figures at the University of Edinburgh in the UK are being warned about their choice of principal, Peter Matheson. That's according to British newspaper The Times on Tuesday. Staff from Hong Kong University said in a letter back in 2018 that Matheson failed to uphold academic freedom and freedom of speech. The letter includes a staff survey. It shows that about 80 percent of respondents strongly disagreed that Matheson had effectively promoted academic freedom. Matheson was the principal of Hong Kong University from 2014 to 2018. And amid pro-democracy student protests in 2017, Matheson signed a joint statement condemning the students. Hong Kong newspaper Apple Daily said that Hong Kong authorities requested the statement. That same year, Matheson announced that video footage of student protesters would be made available to the police. And he moved to curtail anonymity for whistleblowers. Last month, he defended the University of Edinburgh's choice to host a Confucius Institute. Edinburgh is the capital city of Scotland, which is about the same size as South Carolina. A CCP organization directly funds Confucius Institutes. It also decides the curriculum and supplies teachers. Scotland has the highest concentration of Confucius Institutes and programs in the world. Unfavorable opinions towards China are reaching historic highs in countries around the world. This according to a recent report by American think tank Pew Research Center. The survey polled nearly 20,000 adults across 17 countries in North America, Europe and the Asia-Pacific region. In nearly all the countries surveyed, over 80 percent of their respective populations said the Chinese regime does not respect freedoms of its people. 
The think tank reveals that the number of participants who answer this way is or at near record highs. In the U.S., an overwhelming 90 percent of people surveyed said China does not respect people's freedoms. What's more, a wide majority of the countries prioritized having stronger economic ties with the U.S. over having them with China. Only in Singapore and New Zealand did people say relations with China are equal to or more important than with the U.S. China's CCP virus vaccines have made their way around the world to developing countries. Yet doubts about their effectiveness are rising constantly. This week, a leaked government memo in Thailand has stirred up concern among its citizens. Here are the details. A leaked memo from Thailand's Ministry of Health is raising public concern about the Chinese-made Sinovac vaccine. The document called for a booster shot of the mRNA vaccine for medical personnel in Thailand. But it included an objection from an unnamed official, saying that would amount to it admitting that Sinovac is ineffective. The Thai health minister confirmed the memo as authentic, adding that the comment is only an opinion. This doesn't mean the views would turn into action. There are many procedures after that. The hashtag Give Pfizer to Medical Personnel started trending on Thai Twitter after the leaked document was published by local media. Bangkok residents responded soon after. Is it dangerous to us? I was concerned about that too. That's why I don't want to get vaccinated. There's no guarantee. Anyone would be scared because this has to do with life or death. The chairman of Thailand's Thanburi Healthcare Group pointed out that five hospital staff members got reinfected with the CCP virus after receiving the Sinovac vaccine. This means the vaccine Sinovac can't protect people from the virus and the symptoms will be severe. Compared to those who got the AstraZeneca vaccine, which barely has resulted in anyone being admitted to the hospital. Thailand has already acquired 20 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for future use. 1.5 million doses donated by the United States will arrive this month. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, we have a special episode coming up this Friday. During the Cold War, nuclear arms were at the heart of the U.S.-Soviet Union race. Just by being there, these weapons deter others from aggression and thereby serve the cause of peace. Today, the struggle between democracy and communism continues, but the focus has switched from nuclear arms to something much smaller, microchips. It has dramatically enhanced the Chinese Communist Party's military capabilities, and it is now enough a threat for the United States. Containing Beijing's rise in the chip industry, it's like pulling out Beijing's sharpest teeth. But with U.S. and China deeply intertwined, you know, it's hard to hurt China without hurting ourselves. In part two of this special report, we talk about risks that could make America vulnerable and what we are doing to fix them. Be sure to check it out on Epoch TV this Friday at 9 p.m. China in Focus is partnering with the platform. That's where you can watch our exclusive content every Friday night. To subscribe, click epochtv.com slash China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.